So let's see if we're back on life. We should be. There we are. You should see me. Here we are back on life. I'm gonna I'm gonna reshare the link of this stream by doing another nice story on Instagram. Just a second and then we are doing it. And then we're doing the second TED talk of the live show. There we are. Share, copy link. Paste. There we are. So, here we are, live again. Let's go to the view. So, this was the first TED talk we had watched. These are all the TED Talks. This is from three years ago, so not the right one. Let's check out. Uh, it has created this incredible... Whoops. So we have to be really, really careful with this music. So this is from six years ago, so this is the next one. So Ted X. Let's let's see. Here there should be no music. Our office in Copenhagen, it's located inside a uh, former Carlsberg factory uh, where they used to uh, produce the least interesting part of the beer, uh, the bottle cap. Um, but I think it's it's part of this uh, this greater phenomenon that has been interesting over us. Uh. It is an awesome, a really really awesome. Um, it's a really awesome uh, factory and office. I've been there. Uh, thanks to Victoria Millentrup for letting me in. Really love to see it. Uh, the last decade is that it is a former uh, factory space, like a piece of industrial infrastructure that because it's not designed for human beings, but for big uh, manufacturing machines, it has uh, like large spans and tall ceiling heights that makes it incredible for, uh, for actually for, for work or for, for life. Um, so that's this sort of a, a general phenomenon. Typically social infrastructure uh, refers to, um, you know, uh, kindergartens and nurseries and stuff like that. But we mean it much more literally like infrastructural projects that have positive social and environmental side effects. So this is another great project, in my opinion, one of my favorite one, the Vancouver House. And we all know that a piece of infrastructure like a bridge can have a negative impact on a society. Uh, this is where Granville Bridge touches downtown Vancouver, and it, it slices the city up in these uh, useless triangles. And we, we were asked to sort of look if we could turn it into uh, the seed for uh, a nice neighborhood. So uh, we started like mapping the... So yeah, this is always nice to see the constraints of the project. Let's see what are the constraints. Constraints, the setbacks from the bridge. Uh, then there's like a hundred foot setback because the city wants to secure that nobody looks straight into the traffic from the bridge. Then there's a park where we don't want to cast any shadows. Uh, so hundred foot. What is... Let's see. Feet to meters. Hundred, it's just 30 meters, it's not that much. 
So, oops, again, we have to be very careful with the audio of this that talks because YouTube hates people restreaming stuff. Finally, we're left with a tiny footprint. Uh, of like a sort of so, six, this with the casting footprint shadows footprint on this thing, I didn't get. Small to build on. So, then we got the idea that if a 100 foot setback has to do with the minimum distance, once we get 100 feet up in the air, we can come back out, sort of a. Uh, almost as if sort of someone is pulling a curtain aside, sort of welcome to Vancouver, or, or like a, a weed. So again, this is, again, super good idea because first of all, by working with this constraint and convincing the city of doing this uh, comeback of the, after you reach 30 meters, you come out. It's very good uh, because you, for example, enhance the developer to build it because he's going to make more flats and more surface. And for the city, it's good because with less footprint on the ground, you get more, more space. So it's also kind of sustainable. It's, of course, probably the main reason to build it. It's the money, but it's still land, land use that can, can be reduced. Of course, actually, something to be sustainable needs to be also like profitable. It's in the principle of, of sustainability. So you really should be happy with that. Something needs to be sustainable because you want to pay people working on sustainable projects. Growing through the cracks in the asphalt and blossoming when it gets light and air. Um, it's, it's very similar to the flat iron. It's a child of the sort of diagonal of Broadway intersecting the orthogonal grid of, uh, of Manhattan. Um, then because of the rising uh, real estate prices and steel structure and the advent of the elevator, suddenly it became the landmark uh, of a whole neighborhood. Uh, we're just taking that idea maybe one step further. Um, also underneath the bridge, um, we're trying to turn the underside of the bridge into a positive uh, and anyone who's been so doing these jokes probably is part of the concept, but it's still funny. So let's see how they manage the underneath the bridge. Into Vancouver knows that having an urban umbrella could actually be quite nice. Um, and then we're working with some local artists, including Rodney Graham, to turn the underside of the Granville Bridge into what you could call the Sistine's Chapel of street art, like an art gallery turned upside down. Uh, but essentially... Well, this is also great because he looks for opportunities um, to to regenerate to to make even a space that's considered to be very bad something good so he focuses with street art on a bridge He's trying to reinvent the negative impact of the uh, of the infrastructure into something good for the community um, another example is that once a piece of infrastructure gets decommissioned uh, like our office by the way i say he but i meant team them because the whole team makes it and it's not him he's just probably being uh the guy that's trying to help the team to define in which direction to go it can be reinvented um a project we're doing uh, uh or we built in copenhagen next to hamlet's castle combo uh, is the danish maritime museum the museum used to be inside the castle but when they gained uh, UNESCO World Heritage, they had to th put it somewhere else. And it was suggested to put it inside the, the dry dock where they used to build ships. Uh, but we had a dilemma because UNESCO said that we couldn't stick as much as a foot out of the ground to not... So this is another great project I visited and it's really awesome. And the way they want it, it's perfect. It's very, very good. They need. They found the perfect solution for for this museum. Block the view of the castle. Uh, the museum wanted an architectural masterpiece to attract visitors, uh, so we got the idea to turn the dock inside out. In a way, use the museum to preserve the dock. All we needed to do was design a series of bridges. Uh, we could actually build the bridges on a shipyard uh, in China, the way you build ships and lift them into place. So this is a very interesting um, project. Um, let's see, this picture, this frame is super interesting. So because the um, dock was working only by having all the ground right next to it, because there is a certain pressure that was giving stability to the dock, um, when they were building the museum, 
before excavating all this terrain here, they had to go in and put some like, if you go and visit the museum, there are these sort of um, metals coming out that they're covered. They look like round metals. And that's the, um, they had to fix the whole dock in the ground so that when they remove the terrain, it doesn't move, doesn't break, it doesn't shake away because the dock was basically working with the pressure on the sides. And now that there is no pressures on the sides, they had to stabilize the dock and did it by doing this, um, by digging these huge metal uh, posts in the ground that they're keeping the dock stable. And basically the the plot of the competition was to build the museum inside the dock, but they didn't respect the rule. I mean, the team of big um, didn't respect the rules. They did it out around the dock and that was great. So um, in this way, they could, <coughs> um, they could put all the spaces around it. There is a very light slope through the bridges and then all around here there is some sort of a slope that you barely notice you can go all around the museum i mean this is wasn't still excavated back then and then you're again in the beginning and you have a staircase to go out and then you can go around the bridges and leave so again i did a video a vlog about it so if you want to visit the museum there is a particular video it's like 10 minutes where you can experience the museum how it is nowadays in 2023 but it's a super cool project and they did it a super iconic museum without this constraint without blocking the view towards the castle on a shipyard uh, in china the way you build ships and lift them into place uh, one of the bridges slopes with an accessible slope because we couldn't even put an elevator building uh, because it would block the view of the castle. So you can sort of walk on this lazy ramp uh, into the exhibition. You have like intimate spaces, vast spaces, uh, and you have this sort of encounter between the lightness of the glass and the steel and the heaviness and the heritage of the, of the concrete dock. Uh, the auditorium where the seats continue under the stage becoming an auditorium for children. You have uh, the cafe where you look through the different layers of, uh, uh, of glass of the bridges. And not only the auditorium has become a, a cultural venue, but actually the dock itself has amazing... See, you can see these things here that are coming out the grind, ground while well, they're fixing the dock so it doesn't shake around. Acoustics because of the hard walls and the open ceiling. So like this piece of old infrastructure has become a cultural venue. Also, it's super windy in this area because it's right next to the sea there is sweden on the other side so when you go down the dock despite the wind it's not windy in here it's quite cozy much uh, warmer uh, uh, next to hamlet's castle also you have this sort of horizon where below you have this contemporary museum and above the the history of the castle this is this sort of inverse titanic moment yeah that's really cool to experience um, so even not during daylight a um, you know a piece of decommissioned infrastructure get reinvented to become a cultural building, but maybe a cultural building can also be a piece of infrastructure. Um, we're doing a, a museum in a sculpture park in Norway, um, and we could place the museum anywhere we wanted, uh, and we suggested, why don't we make the museum the bridge that takes you over the river and turns the whole promenade through the park into a single loop? So See, this looks quite different than the renderings nowadays, but it looks still similar, and it's really well done. And it has been completed one year ago, you, two years ago. You walk on the paths. Uh, you Again, walk into nice the, to see the uh, renderings the that they were doing the back in the days. The sculpture gallery where the, uh, the skylights turn 90 degrees uh, and become a view of the old mill. Uh, and then you continue. Let's check it out how it looks like nowadays. Let's see. Big Bjorke Ingels Museum in Norway. Well, it actually looks probably quite similar to the renderings here. It's a little bit less glassy. Let's see. Yeah, see here was way more glass. And this is how much glass they have managed to do. But it's still looking pretty dope. I don't know. And this in the renderings looks much more massive than it is nowadays 
And let's keep checking. So in a way, you can see it as both a museum building and a bridge and actually a sculpture. It's almost like the biggest sculpture in the sculpture park. You might not suspect that it's a building uh, uh, from certain angles. So then we leave Scandinavia and, uh, and six years ago, I moved to, uh, to New York. This is probably the coolest project they have done so far. Because we got invited to look at uh, a site on the Upper West Side in Hell's Kitchen. Uh, and we got the idea to try to combine the density. This thing has been watched. I know, TED Talks has 37.5 subscribers. But this thing also has been watched 87k times, so pretty legit. Of a Manhattan skyscraper with the typical communal space of a Copenhagen courtyard, or essentially try to see what would a court scraper look like. Um, so we did put this like typical Copenhagen courtyard on the waterfront. Uh, we lifted it up to 500 feet in the northeast corner, creating this sort of striking new silhouette uh, uh, on the waterfront, opening up to the south and the west for views and, uh, and sunshine. So, um, so this is again a great solution to create density and a striking architecture. And one cool thing for the client is that the building right next to it belongs to the same client. So by doing this crazy shape here, he still keeps the nice view of these apartments back here. Let me make it bigger. So this tower belongs to the same client. So the views are kept towards the River Hudson wide and clean. Uh, the courtyard actually has the same proportions as Central Park, uh, only it is 13,000 times smaller. Uh, <laughs> sort of a bonsai Central Park. And then it has the height of a handrail on one side and the height of a high rise in, in the other. Uh, this was our first sort of rendering of the project. This is what it looks like uh, today. Yeah, uh, it's pretty the cool. First, uh, uh, 50 uh, residents have already moved in. Um, Essentially, it's just like sort of trying to combine... There will be a movie about this one and we have to skip it, otherwise it's going to get striked again. This like rather striking new uh, silhouette on the waterfront. This is the view from the airplane landing in Newark, uh, a view that makes the architect very happy when he returns to... Uh, okay, they're uh, not going to show the rendering but movie, then so it's in New York, uh, great. Two, after, two years after we came here, uh, S Sandy arrived and uh, sort of shut down uh, most of Lower Manhattan. According to a uh, New York cartoonist, it gave rise to a new neighborhood in, uh, in Manhattan. Um, and, and the basic sort of science is simple. Because of rising temperatures, uh, wind speeds are accelerating, which means that the eastern seaboard of the United States are being hit more frequently uh, by heavier and heavier storms. And because of the funnel shape uh, of the New York Bight, uh, um, storm surge is being pushed into the mouth of the Hudson River, putting 50% of the city at risk. And we were invited by uh, HUD, the Housing and Urban Development uh, uh, Department uh, uh, of America, to look at making the 12 miles of contiguous waterfront protection of Lower Manhattan in a way that it wouldn't become a wall segregating the life of the city from the water around it. Uh, and we looked at the High Line. And the High Line is actually today the second most frequent. This is again hedonistic sustainability which means making something that's supposed to be sustainable, pleasant and attractive and sexy so that you want to actually adopt it. The park uh, in New York only uh, uh, superseded by, uh, by Central Park, which is infinitely bigger. And it is essentially a piece of decommissioned train tracks that have now become, uh, you know, with sort of social and environmental programs, so we thought, what if we could design the resiliency infrastructure of Manhattan so that it actually comes with premeditated positive social and environmental side effects? And when you look at the development of New York as a city, it has very much been shaped by the clash of these two titans. Uh, on one hand, you have Robert Moses, uh, the power broker, this public servant who is behind a lot of the major sort of public works of, uh, of New York including highways, uh, housing projects, and parks, but often with a devastating impact on the local community. Uh, he tried to run the Trans-Manhattan Highway through Greenwich Village, and he encountered resistance from uh, Jane Jacobs, who was living in the village, and she uh, rallied the local community, and in a sort of David Goliath moment, she defeated the plans and saved the village. 
So we were thinking that perhaps the dry line, as, as we call this project, could be conceived as the love child of Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs. Uh, <laughs> because to, uh, to resist an incoming flood, you need 12 miles of sort of contiguous and sort of top-down hard engineering, but to make it socially successful, it needs to happen in a closed dialogue with the local community. So we actually devised an idea where on one hand we could take the hard engineering necessary to save us against the next Sandy, but then to design it in closed dialogue with different representatives from the local communities inhabiting the neighborhoods along uh, uh, the big U or the, the dry line. And I'd like to show you a, a Okay, here there is a movie, but we're not watching the movie for clear problems. But basically it's about making this dry line invisible uh, to the common eye. Let's start from here. Let's see how it, well, this is about the Copenhill. Power plant that turns household waste into electricity and district heating. When you look at domestic trash, one ton of trash equals one and two thirds of an oil barrel of, uh, of energy value. But they work on an economy of scale. They're like very. So again, this is how they combine something that it's supposed to be unsustainable, something that's supposed to be ugly, how we can make it nice. Because uh, one big problem, for example, this is a current problem in Rome, is that you have to sell this project to the people, to the communities. Who is going to want to have a trash burning power plant right next to their home? So let's see how they come up with the idea. Big and ugly buildings, they cast shadows on the neighbors, they block the views. This is going to be the tallest and biggest building in uh, Copenhagen. See, they did it something so nice. It's like a curve. It's like a you would love to have a ski track right next to your home, wouldn't you? Uh, right next to the marina and right where the locals go water skiing. Uh, so we were thinking, how can we make this an asset to the community? And speaking of skiing, Danes love to ski. We have snow, but we have absolutely no mountains. Uh, but apparently we have mountains of trash. Uh, so uh, we have to go six hours by car to the south of Sweden to find alpine skiing. Because of the size of our power plant, we can do two thirds of this uh, on the roof of the power plant. So we designed the, the roof complete with a, a, a sort of ski slopes, uh, ski lifts, hiking paths, pine trees. See, this is, and, and this is very close to what they got. I mean, they don't have these huge pine trees, um, but they got this facade and the building looks more or less exactly like this. And you can ski all season because they did it out of this material that's made in Italy, uh, which generates the right traction for skiing. And you don't need even snow. You can uh, ski during summer. I think he says that later on Please, in this talk. Uh, you name it. Um, miraculously, uh, we won the competition on this idea. So uh, suddenly we had to deliver. Um, <laughs> so he did, uh, they did the competition without even uh, believing they're going to manage to win it. But uh, the idea is great because, again, you sell with this design, you can sell the project to the community so that suddenly people are happy to have this infrastructure next to, to their houses. Uh, it's it's going to be twice the length of an Olympic half pipe. And you might remember that in Sochi, Denmark won zero medals. Uh, we hope to sort of uh, improve on that statistic because now, now we can actually sort of practice at home. Uh, I see, also this is a, a great, a, a great way to put it. For all. You can do picnics, you can enjoy the view of the otherwise horizontal city of... Uh, and the view, it's exactly like this and you have these huge windows on the very, very top. Again, did a vlog in Copenhagen. Make sure to watch it. Of Copenhagen, you're going to have the tallest climbing wall in the world. Uh, uh, 300 feet of uh, vertical danger. Um, <laughs> and uh, basically, uh, you can say it's, it's almost realizing an idea of creating cities and buildings like, like man-made ecosystems, because not only do we harvest available resources, daylight, air flows, water. Uh, so it is about exactly this, not being passive and apathic, that things have been always done a certain way, so we cannot do them different. 
differently. It's about thinking first principles and think about how we can do buildings as we would love to have them, not as they're supposed to be. Uh, waterfall, but also together with um, the city of Copenhagen, it forms a metabolism that converts waste into resource. Um, it's currently under construction. Uh, it's it's going to be a pretty epic uh, contribution to uh, to my uh, old hometown. This is like uh, the view from the, the slope. Um, the reason we could win the competition is that the coolest thing about this power plant is uh, that it's the cleanest waste to energy power plant in the world. Uh, the smoke that comes out of the chimney is completely non-toxic. It, it contains only a little bit of uh, steam and a little bit of CO2. Um, but the coolest thing is going to be completely invisible. Uh, you would almost have to like put, put pamphlets out to make people understand that this is a new, uh, completely new kind of technology. Uh, but by put, turning the, the roof into this public park, it becomes blatantly obvious for everybody that you actually have literally clean mountain air on the... Okay, this view, it's impossible nowadays because here in front of the building, there is a huge, long residential block designed by Kobe Architects. Again, if you check the... Uh, um, it's called Visit Copenhagen Like an Architect series. There is a whole episode where we went visit the power plant. And these puffy rings didn't happen because you don't want to have something in this mega structure burning and to put some steam on high pressure and release it on a regular intervals. That's not what you want to do. The power plant, you don't have to be far away from it. It's actually uh, totally safe and clean. To take this like one step further, we designed the chimney of the power plant in such a way that uh, it accumulates steam uh, and then at regular intervals, it puffs a gigantic uh, smoke ring or uh, a ring of steam. So, so rather than being, you know, the, the typical tail of smoke being a symbol of pollution or problem, this becomes a celebration that every time we've saved the emission of one ton of CO2, we celebrate it by puffing a smoke ring. Um, I mean, uh, again, you know, you, you come up with these ideas. Yeah, it didn't and, happen. Uh, <laughs> and then you win and you have to deliver. Okay. I hope we don't get strike for these two little music notes. I forgot they did the uh, craziest movie. So yeah, that was it, the second TED Talk. Ah, it has gotten a little late. We've done two, two streams, one after the other. You let me know if you want to do the talk about the plan for the planet which is these are some of the latest uh, TED talks one is from 2017 uh, so let me know in the chat if you want me to keep going to do this too or we should do it on another day this is from 2017 yeah so it is about the Martian vernacular architecture. They have done a lot of things regarding this and they have released some... Um, it's so funny because if you go to the big DK website, which is not any... Oops, I wrote bid, not big. Big.dk. If you go on the website, which unfortunately is not anymore the old one, it's now called the Big Leap. Uh, when you go on their architecture, they have residential infrastructure work. And then they have space, which is super funny. And then they have the Mars Tune Alpha, the NASA, what is this with NASA? NASA Olympus, which will be on the moon. And then they have the Mars Science City. So they have... A whole section about space architecture. Well, we're going to do this in the next one. So thank you very much for tuning in. We had a little bit of troubles because the first streams got striked. But it's the first format. We're going to do the one about space architecture. It's going to be a video or it's going to be um, or it's going to be something in that direction. So thank you very much for tuning in and stay tuned. 
like the video, subscribe to the channel and see you soon. Bye bye.